is who my love. I want to make you proud. I want to make you smile. why you do the things that you do and as I thought about it this afternoon the only reason why I do is because I want to make Jesus proud I want him to look down and say that girl hi I want you to look again and say that girl chai I want you to look another and say ah she's sweet my belly that's just that's just me I don't know about you because some of us are singing it like we're vexing. Yes, yes, I want to make you proud. I shall we make you proud. I will try to make you proud. If you give me car first, oh, you better know why you come. Father Lord, we worship you this afternoon. We give you all the praise. We ask, Lord, that the desire to please you and the desire to make you proud and smile will surpass every other desire in our lives. And Lord, as that consistently is the desire of our hearts, Lord, grant the grace that we might follow through. Thank you, God of heaven. We commit this afternoon's word into your hands. We ask, O oh God, by your spirit, that you will teach us by yourself. And that this word, oh God, mixed with faith will go on and will yield extraordinary, stupendous, incredulous results. That your name and your name alone will be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Please be seated. I'll be fast, don't worry. Hallelujah. Good afternoon. If you're joining us online, welcome to the, way, with the Well Oasis International. This is our main service. And um, we're in a series known as the Parables. This series, we began 14 weeks ago. We're looking at, actually 15 weeks ago, we're looking at the parables of Jesus um, and what they mean for our current or present day realities as believers. Last week, we looked at the parable of the two sons, where the father said to one son, it was found in Matthew chapter 21. The father said to the first son, he said, look, I want you to go do some work in my vineyard. 
And the son said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, dad, I'm, I'm not going. No, he actually said, no, dad, I can't go. I'm not going to go. And the Bible said along the way he repented. He regretted that he even said that to his father. Changed his mind and went on to do what his father had asked him to do. Then the father went to the other son and said to him, I want you to go walk in my vineyard. And that one said, sure, dad, not a problem at all. I go right away. And the Bible said he didn't go. Jesus gave the parable and he asked the, 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 the uh, elders, the chief priests and the elders, he said, which one of these did the will of the father? And last week I was saying to us that it was interesting that the question was not which one of these was a good child. The question was which, was which one of these did the will of the father? Because as believers, sometimes as believers, sometimes we want to be called good Christians that yet we don't walk in the will of God. So that you recognize that it doesn't matter what the reputation is that you have garnered and created for yourself. If it's not according to the will of God, you've wasted your time and the resource that God has put inside of you. We looked at that parable and we talked about the difference between delayed obedience and disguised obedience. And we said why both of them are not the best possi possible way we could react or respond to God. Delayed obedience is better than disguised obedience. Hallelujah. Then we looked at the power of repentance. That even though the first son said, I am not going to go. The moment he changed his mind and he, start, he went back to do what his father wanted, he was fine. He went step right back into the will of God. Just so that you recognize that it's not whether you missed the will. The first time that matters is did you recognize you missed it? And are you willing to come back into the will? That's the big answer that you need to find for yourself. Today we're moving right along and we're looking at another parable, the parable of the wicked tenants. It's also found in Matthew chapter 21 as well as Mark chapter 12. But since we've already been in Mark, Matthew chapter 21, we're going to just focus on, Matthew, on the Matthew 21 version. Matthew 21 from verse number 33 to verse number 46. And as I looked at this, I saw that this parable was different. This parable was different because this parable wasn't revealing to us kingdom. Instead, this parable was telling, uh, telling us or warning us about the consequences that would come should we not pay attention to the things that God has said to us. Again, this is a follow-up parable right in the, at the heel of the one that we looked at last week. So it was addressed to the same people, the chief priests and the, who? the elders. These are the leaders, in the, if you like, in the church in that day. So it, wasn't, it is not exactly a parable that is saying to you, oh, when you look carefully into what kingdom should look like, X, Y, Z is what you will find. Instead, it is, a, it is a parable warning us about the consequence coming or the judgment coming to those who refuse to pay attention and adhere to what they have been taught, adhere to what they've been command, commanded and uh, obeyed what they've been commanded and to receive or to deploy properly what they have received. I said it's a warning to all those who have received, who've been taught something and they've refused to adhere to it. It's a warning for those who've been commanded or given a command and they have not obeyed. And it is a warning to those of us who have received something from God that we have not utilized it or deployed it the way he wants us to. The parable essentially is about a landowner and his tenants and into the mix is his son. Listen to another parable, verse 33 of Matthew 21. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to tenant farmers and went on a journey to another country. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his share of the fruit. But the tenants took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants more than the first time and they treated them the same way. Finally, verse 37, he sent his own son to them saying they will respect my son and have regard for him. 
But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this man is the heir. Come on, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took the son and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, who are the day? The chief priests and the elders. They said to him, he will put those despicable men to a miserable end and rent out the vineyard to other tenants of good character who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Jesus asked them, have you never read in the scriptures? The very stone which the builders rejected and threw away has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous and wonderful in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to another people who will produce the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was talking about them. And although they, they were trying to arrest him, they feared the people. Because they regarded Jesus as a prophet. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when you go back to the top of Matthew chapter 21. You, uh, you follow the trend of the conversation. Remember that this is a conversation that Jesus started to have with these people. And they came to him first. They had devised a question. And the question was. The, they said to him. By whose authority and power do you do the things that you do? In response to that, Jesus asked them, he says, the, uh, the, um, um, the baptism of John, is it of God or is it by man? Is it from God or from man? They sat together, they agreed, and they, they gave him a doctored reply. They said, we do not know. But that's after they have processed it and they said to themselves, if we say from John, uh, from man, they will say to you, the, the people will stone us, and if we say for, from God, he will ask us, why did you not believe in, in John? So this was an ongoing conversation that Jesus was having with the same group of people. And this is exactly, probably, a week before Jesus took the bow. This was a week before Jesus would be crucified. If we look at the details of the parable, you find that the, the characters are there. The first one was a landowner. He owned land. And he planted a vineyard in that land and put a wall around it and dug a wine press on it and built a tower. Everything that would make the vineyard functional to deliver on the promise of the, the seed that has been put in that ground, a.k.a. the seed of the vine, he made sure he had put in place. On top of that, he put a wall around it because he didn't want trespass, trespassers to come and take that which he had worked for. In those days, um, 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 vineyards were very lucrative, but they were also very time demanding. And because of that, he didn't want to be, he was going to travel. He didn't want to have to um, not be comfortable perhaps where he was going. So he decided to rent it out because, or, 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 yes, hire it out. Because what happened in those days is that just as it was expensive but very lucrative to plant vineyards, there were people who had the skill to care for vineyards but they didn't have land. And so they would do a collaboration. The one who has the land would lease it. And then the other people would come and the, uh, the, 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 the agreement usually was at harvest time, they would split the, pro the harvest in certain percentages. So this man was going to travel and he decided to do a business deal with this tenant. He called them, he said, I'm going to travel. If you want to hire my ground or if you want to lease my vineyard, you can. Just know that at the end of the day, when it's time for the harvest, I might not be back, but I will send people to come and collect my share of the harvest to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. So he rented it out to tenant farmers, farmers who didn't own land, but had skills. They leased land, they work it, and they share the proceeds with the landowner. Land the landowner went on on a journey. And it reminds me of, the, of Jesus in Luke chapter 10 when he said, Occupy till I come. Because in the end, if you go with me back to Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 all the way through to verse number 30, 
This earth has been given to us to occupy until Jesus comes. We are supposed to do business and turn a profit as we were here because we've been left here. And that was exactly, I just wanted you to see it because I'll talk about it a bit more at, uh, towards the end. What was happening here? Everything that would make the earth prosper, everything that would make the earth yield, everything that would make the earth lucrative. If you look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, uh, verse 29, the Lord said, and he created sustenance for the sustainers. I've taught us this before. So he said to the animals, don't worry what you will eat I have provided. And he said to the plants, even what the plants will eat, I have provided. And all of this to feed the man so that the man can walk the earth and the man can continue to grow by the earth. When we get to Genesis chapter 2 verse number 15, what you find is that he said to Adam, after he had planted the garden Eden, he said to Adam, he said, walk this garden, tend the land and keep it. But when you take a look at that land, if you look properly, or the garden, if you look properly in your scripture, you will notice that he didn't give him barren land. He didn't give him seedless land. He didn't give him um, 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 a, a jungle. He gave him a land, a garden that had four rivers flowing out of it. What that meant was that what the Lord leads to man was capable of providing everything that man ought to give back to God. And so when we look at this parable, I want you to see the parallels as we go on and just put it into your, the New Testament realities and see these three parallels of what is happening. So the harvest time came and he said, well, I have a vineyard. It's time for harvest. I'm going to send some people to go and get my share of the harvest. So he sent his servants. They got there. The Bible said they saw one, they beat one, they beat, they stoned the other, they killed the third. This tenants. I need you to recognize that the scripture did not say that the vineyard did not produce. The scripture did not say that the vineyard was run over by vagabonds. The scripture did not say that there was nothing wrong with the vineyard. Up to this time, the, the agreement was intact. But when it came to the time to pay, he said to the, they said they decided, no, we can't pay this man. Instead, we will keep killing the people that he brought. And if you go to Isaiah 55, you will see a chronicle of when God was speaking about Israel and how everybody he sent to the, the nation of Israel, the ancient of Israel killed. Either killed them, slaughtered them, just did something to ensure that these people never got them to return to God. The glory that yielded, the earth yielded on, through them for God. And so when they, he, they, 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 he got word that those first set of servants were killed, he sent another set, more in number than he had sent before. And they did exactly what they did to the first set to this one. At that point, I will ask for a, a battalion of soldiers. Because I mean, this is my land. It's my vineyard. I planted it. I put everything in place to make sure that the wine was properly, the wine was good wine. They have no right to deny me of what I had worked for. Their only job was to tend it. Your only job is to tend the earth. I would have asked for a truckload of soldiers and they would have known that someone owned that vineyard. But the Bible in verse 37 said, finally, that is after he had sent servants and they kept killing and maiming. And there was one, if you look at an, a particular version, I don't remember what version. He said they crushed his head. After he had done or sent everyone and nothing happened, he decided to send his only son. The Bible said his only son. And he said, surely they will know this is my son. They will respect him. And they will listen to him. And the Bible said, when they saw the sun coming, they knew he was the heir apparent to that vineyard. So there was no miscommunication. There was nothing. Everybody knew their place. But they decided that, you see, he, he sent his son. 
If we just Kukuma kill his son, what's going to happen is there will be no one to inherit this land. And as long as there's no one to inherit this land and this vineyard, we can have it. Because the culture those days was if you go into a wild field and there's no one claiming the field, you can claim it. So even though this one belonged to someone, they decided to claim it by destroying the owners so that it becomes their own. It reminds me of another parallel, number four parallel, of how the devil decided that the earth was his. And he decided that it didn't matter what happened. He would crush and crush and crush until everybody stepped away. And he, be, he even decided to create parallel systems and we call them the word. And we got to the point that because the son, Adam, and the first Adam gave up his right and authority, we have gotten to the point that we even call the devil the prince of this word. And this parable was Jesus saying, I'm coming back. And I'm coming for what is mine. Everything that I kept here and I put you in charge. There is not, not just a day of reckoning and a day in which you will give account. If I come and I do not get the account that I deserve and I require. There is something that can happen with you and will happen to you when I come. So he sent his son and they did not respect his son. They did not have any regard for him. They decided to kill him so that they could take over his inheritance. They took the son. It's instructive that they cast him out of the vineyard before they killed him. Just the same way the Jews would not kill Jesus within the four walls. They had to take him outside to, slow, to, to hang him. So this, the stage is set, is set for God to do what he wants to do if he would do it and do it fast. But this parable was to the elders and to the chief priests. If this parable was to unbelievers or to the Gentiles, we'll say, well, it's to be expected that these ones would definitely have to suffer this consequence and this punishment. But it was to the chief priests and to the elders. Hallelujah. The question he asked when he had told them what happened was, when the owner of the vineyard comes, because he didn't say if, he said when. You need to recognize that the owner of the vineyard will come. He said when the owner of the vineyard comes back, what will he do to those tenants? They were the ones that replied. They said he will put those despicable men to a miserable end. <laughs> And then he will rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will pay. If I will quickly draw a fifth parallel out of this point, you will notice that Paul said that you and me were the wild olive that were grafted in. And the only reason why we are grafted in and we have this access that we have today was because the one who first received the promise did not regard the promise. Jesus responded to them because they could not even see that this was about them. So Jesus said to them, have you not been reading your Bible? <laughs> have you never read the scriptures? He said to them, the stones that the builder rejected, the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And he went on to say, it is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. Then he said to them, he said, the kingdom of God will be taken away and given to people who will produce the, pr the fruit of it. And I was looking at this parable and I was saying to myself, Lord, what is all of this about? What exactly is all this plenty conversation about? What does God want from you and from me? What is it that would make him continue to act like he doesn't know what he's doing? He will continue to send people to those people that he knows that they will kill them. Why was he consistently making this investment in people who he knew didn't want to be invested in? Then he hit me. When the Lord created the earth, a.k.a. his vineyard, he gave us stewardship. He gave us what? Stewardship. 
He gave us stewardship over the people. He gave us stewardship over his resources. And he gave us stewardship over um, the revelation that he will commit into our hands. And whatever we do, if we take those things that he had committed into our hands and we use them properly, then we would have a profit to turn over to him when he comes back. But if we do not, especially if you are a leader, if you do not take into account that the people that he gave them to you, he leads them to you, he did not dash them to you, then a day is going to come where he's going to be asking you, where are my people? And your answer better be a right, the right answer. For some of us, it's not people per se. But he gave us revelation. He gave us intelligence. He gave us grace. And he said, steward this for me. Everything that, con that, um, everything that makes for life and godliness, I have put inside of this revelation. If you work it well, it will yield you a profit. I just want a part of it. He is going to come back and he's going to ask, what did you do with that which I left with you? For the others of us, he put resources in our hands and we were just meant to trade with these resources. So that kingdom will feel like, yes, I made a good investment in the earth. But here they were, they did not even know that he was talking about them. They had no idea. They had so much gap that they did not even realize that the parable was about them. He had to tell them that it was about them. And as I was preparing, I said to myself, may I not be so insulated and insensitive that God will be calling me out and I would not know. So when he came back and he asked them, what should they do? What will this owner do? They said, ah, that owner will put those despicable men to a miserable end. And then he will give the vineyard to other people. Jesus said, have you not read the scriptures? Do you not know that the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Don't you know that it is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight? Oh, by the way, in case you still not, do not understand, the kingdom will be taken from you. And it will be given to some other people who do what? Who will produce the fruit of it? Because the idea is that you were entrusted because they knew that you had the raw material. Remember that he built this vineyard. He, 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 he built the wall. He put a, a, a wine press there. He built a tower. Everything to make it functional. This stone that we're talking about, if somebody falls in, on that stone, it will break the person to pieces. If it falls on that person, it will crush him to death. I'm going to come to it. The landowner, obviously, is God. We know that. The tenants are the prophets and teachers of old. Everyone that sent, they sent to you to tell you that Jesus requires something out of you. And you said to him, his mouth was smelling. That's the word. The vineyard is the earth, the people, the revelation, the resources. Everything that God gave to you for rulership in this earth, aka as you find in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, that is the vineyard. And I started to look at the elements of what he did in that place, a wall, a wine prince, and a tower. And I said, Lord, what do these three things mean? And he said, the wall is a spiritual cover. For everyone that I will call, I will put cover over them. It might be a word, it may be a house, it may be a man, something that keeps you safe. It might be an instruction, something that keeps you safe while you are walking your path of the earth. And I said, so what is the wine press? He said, the wine press, you know the Holy Spirit, yes? I said, yes. He said, the wine press is worship. Everyone that I put on the earth, I expect something from them, worship. And I've told us before that worship has nothing to do with the songs and the dance. Worship is our lifestyle. So I said, okay then, Lord, what is the witnessing? What is the, uh, the tower? And he said, do you know what they do with the tower? I said, yes, you stand there and you watch. If someone is coming, you say, oh, there's someone coming. I see someone coming from a distance. He said, everyone that I put in the earth to do business till I come must witness, must tell someone else about me. 
You will have cover and there will be people you will cover. Your, your entire life and everything you do must be worship. And then you must witness or disciple other people. Witness. These are the expectations. So when he built the vineyard, he didn't just leave it and say to them, I would require worship. He put it in place. Yours was just to go with the flow of the spirit so that you can do what you were supposed to do. As I looked at this parable, I realized that there is nothing that God requires of me that he did not first give to me to, 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 to prepare me to be able to give back to him. So what are God's expectations? What was it that this uh, chief priest and the elders didn't do? What was it that they failed to do? Number one, they failed to meet God's expectations. What are God's expectations? Threefold. And when you, I, 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 I talk about them, you will see that they tie nicely with the things that he put in, the, in that vineyard. Number one, to honor God as God. That's the first expectation God has of every single one of us. To honor God as God. Number two, to obey his laws. And number three, to share him with the word. So when we close from service here, we say the Shema. I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And I will love my neighbor as myself. But that's our commitment that no matter what happens, ultimately I will share you, Lord, with someone else in the course of my week. That's why we close our services like that, in case you didn't know. But the tenants had attitude. That's no longer in doubt because it's spelled out, it was spelled out in their killing of not just the, the, the servants. He killed, they killed the, the, the owner of the vineyard's son as well. But the tenants were resisting. That's what it was. It was a resistance. In our day, we'll resist his word. In our day, we'll resist his instruction. In our day, we'll resist his servants or his messengers. Anything to make us feel like we don't need to answer to someone. So they kept resisting. And the moment you resist the one that God sent, you are not honoring God. The moment you resist the one that God sent, you can't obey his laws. The moment you resist his instruction, his words, and his messenger, there is nothing you, have res you would have to share with the world. So they resisted. And I was asking, Lord, what was the resistance about? Because they agreed from the beginning. Take what you need, I will take what I need. But I will provide everything that works it out. And I realized that men tend to distort their understanding of God to justify their disobedience. Men tend to distort their understanding of God to justify their disobedience. So these ones will be saying, well, when we started this business, we didn't realize that you were going to send someone in so soon. We begin to dis um, what, distort. What does that mean? We begin to want to change go our understanding of God simply because we want to justify why we are resisting his word. We want to justify why we are not doing what he's called us to do. So we, we hang on something that happened to us that wasn't really nice. So we hang on something we feel that we do not have. So we have a shortage. Because we have a shortage, we cannot obey God. So we will hook on something that, that is not convenient. We'll say it's an inconvenient time. And so nobody serves God when it is inconvenient. Anything to make us justify our disobedience, even if it means we will distort our understanding of God, is easy. So they started to kill the servants. As if they did not understand the agreement they entered into with the master before he left. The second thing that, oh, and this is the one. This is where we eat, chew, and sleep, and we wake up. We misinterpret or mistake the grace of God as, his, as indifference on his part. So the first time he said to them, I'm going. For a long time he was away. He didn't send anybody. He didn't ask them anything. So they thought, surely he has forgotten that he has a vineyard. <laughs> then the day he sent someone, they said, we are not sure those people came from him. Because you have to have an excuse, yes. We are not sure those people came for him, from him. Because he's been indifferent for so long that surely he can't wake up now and say he wants this vineyard back. 
We mistake, we misinterpret or mistake gra the grace of God as indifference. You say, oh, because God is showing me grace in the things that I should have perished the, perished the first time, he allows me a, the opportunity over and over and over for repentance. I begin to, after a while, I begin to think that God actually will not do me anything. That's why we go around with very, very terrible definitions of the word grace. We think that just because it suits the way we have started to engineer our lives and walk, choose to walk with God, that that is what God meant when God talk, spoke about grace. God's grace is not God's indifference. God cares very much about the agreement he entered with you and me. The mere fact that by his grace he's taken his time does not mean that he lost his marbles. And my big question was, Lord, if they, would, they have killed the, tenant, the, the servants, why would you send your son? He said he was an extension of my grace. I was just hoping that this time they will recognize that I have, this is my final answer to them. So that they would embrace what I was extending to them. That they might have a change of heart and have a change of life. So people misinterpret the grace of God as if God is indifferent to the things that they do. So you hear conversations like this on the street a lot. He says, since my grandfather, they've been saying Jesus will come. And Jesus has not come. So I don't think that thing is correct. Jump where? Let's continue to watch and let's continue to see. Whether he's coming or whether he's not coming. It always doesn't begin by saying God is not coming back. It begins by number one, resistance. I told you. Bide me go left, Joe. Like Joe, I tell ya. Bide me go right. God, you own too much stuff. Resistance. When you resist him long enough, you become insensitive. Because the Bible says that the, the, the God of this world would dull your senses. He says it would blind you. Do you understand it? So you are no longer sensitive to the things that used to be alarms. That tell you, stop. You can't cross that line. You now cross the line 55 times every day. And it's fine. That's when the Bible begins to see we drink iniquity as if we drink water. Why would someone be drinking iniquity like water? Because it no longer hurts his tummy. That's why. His tummy is now used to nonsense. So he becomes insensitive. Once you hit insensitivity, guess what happens? Disobedience becomes your, your, brother, your twin. Every listener says, no, me. You, know, you actually have now crafted a new way that God deals with people. You say that's why you, you will hear stories that someone says adultery is covered by grace. It says we, we are so anointed that grace covers us. You begin to hear people spew nonsense because as they are spewing the nonsense, they are distorting their view of God and their understanding of God just so that their disobedience is okay. It sounds really nice. So there are people who are looking for the anointing that would not count Adultery or something. So, so there's that kind of anointing. That's the type I want. You see all the sin you want. God still uses you. God still loves you. God still expands your ministry. God still does this. And God still does. That's the type I want. After a while in living in disobedience, God doesn't even bother to talk to you anymore. Is it not when he talks to you, you will hear? So he doesn't, just doesn't bother anymore. So you, that's when you begin to find that they have gaps. That's why Jesus stood in front of them, gave them this parable that even you and me who were not there knew what it meant. And they did not get it. Because I promise you if they got it, they would never have said, we will kill, he will kill or put those despicable people um, and tenants to a miserable end. They will never have declared that over themselves. But when you become insensitive, if, when you begin, you continue to resist the way that the spirit is saying, asking you to go. What you find is becoming insensitive. Disobedience becomes your, twi your CME swi twin. And ultimately, you don't hear anything from him anymore. At that point, the stone that the builders rejected. They say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I don't think so. 
It says the Messiah of the world. They say they are still waiting for the Messiah today. So many things begin to go wrong, but you are now so insulated that you don't see it anymore. The problem with grace, I heard a man of God say this and I want to repeat it. He said the problem with grace is that we can get the misconception that we can get away with rejecting God. That's the problem with grace. That's grace misunderstood. You can begin to walk around with the misconception that you can get away with rejecting God simply because you walk in grace. Because every disobedience is sin. Every sin is, you get the point. And when it is disobedience and it is sin, sin is not the act. Sin is the mindset or is the decision to reject God in anything. So the man said, he said, look, when you carry grace without understanding, or when you begin to talk grace without truly understanding grace, what happens is that you run around with a, a warped sense of grace that says you can continue to get away with rejecting God and nothing will happen to you. Then he said, he said, but we cannot. He said, because grace is unconditional and grace is unlimited in scope, but it is not in duration. He said, grace is unconditional, yes. Grace is unlimited in scope, yes. But it is not unconditional. It is not without a duration. What that means is that a day comes when it runs out, when the, it's judgment day. There's no grace available on that day. A day comes when the owner of the vineyard says, well, you keep my servants, I sent more servants. You killed those ones, I sent more. Then ultimately, I sent my son because I mean, how many servants can I let you kill? I sent my son thinking that that would jolt you to something. You killed my son too. That was my final, and that was my final, and that was my final olive branch to you. Even that you didn't take. So now, the only thing that remains is judgment. It said, it said, the stone that the builder rejected shall become, has become a chief cornerstone. And I had to, because I've listened to this, I've, I know that scripture and I have different explanations of it, but in this context, it didn't make sense. So I started to research it. I said, what do they even mean? It turns out that in those days, in the execution process in those days, they had two execution processes. The first one was to build a scaffold high up there. And then they would put a big stone, uh, put someone there. They would set stones on the, on the, at the bottom, on the ground. So they would take the person who has sinned, who needs to be punished or whatever. They would take him up the scaffold. Then they would push him. They would push him. So he will fall on stones, which means that his bodies will be broken. His bones will be broken. He would have all kinds of breaks. But they said to me, I, I, the research said to me, that that was grace. That was mercy. That because he, they do it in such a way that he doesn't quite die, but he's so broken, and they give him time to see whether he would repent in the process. And if he repents, that's fine. Because he will heal. He may have a limp. He may be deformed a bit. But at least he has his life back. Do you get it? But then there was another execution style. And this was usually reserved for those who had been thrown down from the scaffolding. And they did not repent after time. This ones they actually take this huge rock and they crush them with it. So there is no opportunity for change. And Jesus was saying to them. If you fall upon the stone, it will break you to pieces. If the stone falls upon you, it will crush you. Any which way, this is not God's best for you. So why would you not take the escape route in Jesus that had been given to you? I started to look at this thing and I'm like, oh God. This is not even so much about kingdom. This is about how we are doing right now. So God created the earth. He created man in his image after his likeness. Then he gave man a five-fold mandate. And he said to man, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. And when you do that, you become the ambassador of God in the earth. 
And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 2, God said, uh, God ceased from his work. But then he put man, the flesh to man. Then he created, he, put man, he took man to the garden that he had set up. He said to man, tend this garden. He said to Adam, look at all the animals. Whatever you call them, that will be their name. He put man to work. And I saw in Genesis chapter 3 that everything that God created in the vineyard so that Adam would have the superiority of his authority and just do things, Adam lost it to one decision. The moment they ate, they didn't lose the earth because the devil doesn't need the earth, but they lost the authority to govern the earth. And I told us that when you think about the earth, it's the resources that God puts in your hands. It's the ideas or the revelation that he gives you. And he's the people that he puts around you to lead to him. What he expects you to do, whether with the resources or with the revelation or with the people, is that you must honor God as God. We must obey his laws and we must share him with the word. And this was what the Jews were not doing in that time. And Jesus was saying to them, it's one week. In one week. In one week. If you don't shape up in one week, I am going away. When I go away, if you do not take this, if I go away, if you continue to reject this offer, if I go away, then the door will be open to anyone whosoever believeth in him shall be saved. All I want to see is, did they, do they produce the fruits of the life of God in them? It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't want, matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They will be welcome in. And just like that, what was supposed to be exclusive for a people opened up because they consistently continued to reject God. Today, they will tell us that we are the spiritual Israel. The question is, as you are the spiritual Israel, what are you doing? The problem is the spiritual Israel is beginning to act like the physical Israel. That's exactly what we are doing. We have distorted our understanding of God just simply because we want to excuse our disobedience. So there are no standards, there are no yardsticks again. Anything goes, after all, there is grace available. And Jesus wasn't saying anything too deep here. What he was saying simply was, look, <laughs> if you don't shape up, you will be shaped out. If you don't shape up, you will be shaped out. I used to say to people that you ought to be afraid when I give you a long rope. If you're dealing with me, it is better for you that I hack you every three minutes. Because it means that there's love left from me to you. But if I just, if you are pulling a rope from me and it is rows and rows and rows and rows of rope, what I just did was give you enough rope to hang yourself. And if you continue to do as you do, you will soon hang yourself, I can tell. Jesus was in a manner saying, you see, I gave you long rope Abuse upon abuse. Now that same rope, I will let you use you to hang yourself now. Use it to hang yourself now. My friends, my brothers, my sisters. This journey is not a journey of I wear fine suit, I come to church. This journey is not I went to vigil and I prayed and God gave me a car. This journey is not about I live in the best part of town. When I say Jesus, everybody begins to sneeze. This journey is beyond that. This journey is a journey where he will come back to inspect what you and me have done in the here and in the now. Just because you have been born again for donkey years and nothing has changed does not mean that he's not coming. 
And just because they told you that he was going to come in 1914 and he didn't show up in 1914. Then they said to you, we come in 1960 something and he did not show up in 1960 something. Then they said at Y2K, definitely he's coming at Y2K, nothing happened. Does not mean that he's not coming. So stop acting like there is no day of reckoning. He said, are you that dumb and blind that you cannot even see that I'm talking about you? Why would you think that is one miserable person? Why are you thinking is one despicable person? Why is the church always pointing at someone outside the building? They are preaching to us. We are pointing figures to someone outside who is not hearing the preaching. Doesn't that tell you that something, there is a, there, there is a, 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 a break in transmission that we don't understand? If they wanted to tell the people, we did not go and tell the people. If they are telling you, doesn't that mean that you should pay attention? If they are telling me, should I not be paying attention? Why is it that every time they begin to talk about sin, we're thinking of the one who didn't go to church for the last 20 years. But you who's been coming to church four times and six times a week, how has your life been? How has my life been? If they came today and they brought the microscope, now that's too far. If they just brought a mirror and they put you in front of it, what will we see? If they brought a mirror and they put me in front of it, what shall we be looking at? Guys, unlike the one that we're talking of the future, this one is now, we need to change something and we need to change something fast. The Lord is saying, I trusted you to produce something from the vineyard. I made all the investment that was required. I did not only give you sustenance, I gave your sustenance sustenance. So your sustenance cannot say that it cannot feed you because it was not fed. So yet in the end, you take my grace for granted. You're going around saying that God is indifferent. It doesn't matter. If you sin, it's okay with God. If you do not sin, it's okay with God. It's not hard like that. Stupidity! At the highest, highest order. See, no hard reach like that now. Who is, why, 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 are we, why are we so judgy? Wait. They are coming. Friends, let's not be people in the house who when they are looking for someone to raise, they will not find and they will go outside to go and beg somebody. Let it not be that you become the, you are, right now you are the departmental head. There is a promotion ahead. They look at you, they look at you, they say you are not fit, they go outside and bring someone. Because all this while they've been telling you that we will no longer use typewriter. You said that they told you that you read in one article that computer emits rays. So because of that, you made up your mind that you cannot use computer. When it is time for a partner, when the opening for a partner comes, they will go outside and bring the one that is compliant. I hope you can see it now. Guys, the Lord is relying on us. He wants us to not just know, he wants us to be. He's tr entrusted all of this in us or to us because he can't do it by himself anymore. If I would make one final appeal, even though I shouldn't be making an appeal, I would say to you that God needs us. So we need to shape up so that we will not be shipped out. Let me first talk to the unbeliever. If you're out there, even if you're in here, and you've heard a lot about God. You just think he's for those people who are for the dirty. It's for the fanatics. Don't allow the curtain to shut on you without giving your life to Jesus. Then let me come home and talk to the believers who cannot even. We have lived our lives so recklessly that nobody looks at our lives again and wants to be a believer. If that's how believers do, I don't want. 
You are now the poster girl of, and poster boy of turning people away from kingdom. Today is the day that we also come back and say, Lord, now I realize that we we're not talking to the people outside. They were talking to me too. I surrender all. Then of course, let me talk to those of us that are so used to being parties with God that we don't share him with anybody else. If somebody even came to you and say, I want to go to church with you. Or they called you on the phone and they say, I would like to go to church with you. On the Sunday when you are going to church, when you think that their house is far, driving that distance will be a detour. You change your mind. You remembered before you left home. You drive to church anyway and then the Monday when they send you a message, you say, I was waiting. Say, Chai, I forgot. Simply because it is not convenient for you to inconvenience yourself to share Jesus with them. Whether you are the person who refuses to share or you are the believer that thinks that grace means that God is indifferent or you're the one outside who is thinking, well, since how many years they've been saying Jesus will come but he has not come. All of us need to change. I don't want the picture of the stone to be erased from your mind too quickly. They can throw you on the stones or they can throw the stone on you. But our God is a God of mercy. And as far as I'm concerned, the simple reason that he allowed me to go through this again today is so that I can put a microscope to my own life and ask myself, Bide me, what are you doing? How are you taking grace for granted? I want us to bow our heads. If you're taking grace for granted, you're quarreling with God over things that God had no hand in. Today is the day that we come and say, Lord, I repent and I surrender myself to you totally and completely. If you're here and, or you're online and you have not given your life to Jesus, it is also a great day for you to say with me today, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I'm not just coming so that I, you can solve my problems. I'm asking that you come and become my Lord and my Savior. I'm not just coming to say, forgive me for the sin I sinned yesterday. I'm here to say, Lord, I release myself to you. Come and be my Lord and choose for me who I become from this moment on. If you want to give your life to Jesus, just say where you are seated. Or online, type it and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. If you and me have been jumping around and thinking grace means that Jesus will never come back. That because grace is unlimited and unconditional, that it means it has no duration. So it doesn't lapse. Today is the day to repent and say, Lord, I am the tenant to the vineyard who would return a prophet. I am the tenant in the vineyard who is determined to return a prophet. Father, Lord, I want to live my life in such a way that I make you proud. I want to live my life in such a way that I make you smile. Lord, every morning, every night, every noon, whatever, when you think about me, the picture I want to, I have in my mind is that you just begin to smile. That you're smiling because you know that I have made the efforts because you have given me the resources to make sure that my life is pleasing to you. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I return to the place where I understand that I want to make you proud again. I will not be the one that will kill the messenger. I will not try to steal your inheritance. Lord, this earth that you have given me to steward, the people, the resources, the revelation, Lord, may it turn a profit, O oh God. Smile. I want to make you smile. Jesu, Jesu, my heart. I want to make you smile. 
Lord, I pray for everyone who might have given their life online today. Lord, that you hold on to them and you will never let go. Lord, do not let them leave your hand. May their lives bring you glory. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' name.